Hey, this is Buddy. Buddy's going to help me teach you guys about climate classification. Buddy knows a lot about climate change, but we're going to talk about climate classification today. Um, the main way that climate is classified around the world is something called the Köppen climate classification system. It's named after a Russian-born German, you know, all the Russian-born Germans out there, named Vladimir Köppen. Um, the Köppen classification system uses three things to classify climate. The first is temperature. That makes sense. Most people, when you think about, hey, what's the climate of Florida? It's warm. Yeah. Um, precipitation. That makes sense, too. That's it. The third thing is probably the least intuitive for most people, and it incorporates vegetation. So we're talking about temperature, precipitation, and vegetation, all used to define separate climate areas around the world. We'll start out with tropical. Can anybody tell me what tropical means? Buddy, what does tropical mean? Tropical means warm. Very good, buddy. Tropical means warm temperatures. Wait a minute. Did one of you just say something about wet? Because tropical doesn't mean wet. Tropical means warm, but it doesn't mean wet. Many people think tropical rainforest. Oh, and that's actually our first category of a tropical climate. It's something called tropical wet, or basically what you would call tropical rainforest. And that is a type of tropical climate, but not all tropical climates are wet, as we'll see in a minute. So what defines a tropical rainforest? Well, they have to have at least two, just under two and a half inches of rain each month, and there are no seasons, meaning it's the same weather every day year-round. Our next tropical climate is going to be the tropical monsoon climate. Um, pretty close to tropical rainforest, but they have at least one dry month a year. Um, and that that's the result of a seasonal wind change. Um, when you think of tropical monsoon, lots of people think of like India, Bangladesh, that type of area of the world where they have a very wet monsoon. There are also drier areas that get a monsoon but wouldn't be considered tropical monsoon climate. Our third tropical climate is going to be tropical wet dry. This would be the savanna. If you've seen the Lion King, you've seen the savanna. Um, it's grassland, there's a few small trees, um, and that's indicative of relatively little rainfall. Um, essentially, they have two seasons a year. They have a wet season, and they have a dry season, and that's the total of their se seasonal variation on a yearly basis. Then the next major classification is dry, so the dry climate. That means their potential evapotranspiration is higher than their precipitation. So what do I mean by potential evapotranspiration? If you recall from earlier in the unit, evapotranspiration is the sum total of the amount of water that evaporates and the amount of water that is given off by plants through transpiration. Potential evapotranspiration is the amount of water that would evaporate if there were water there and the amount of water that would be given off by plants if there were plants there and water there. Our first dry climate is going to be semi-arid. This would be a place where they have a little precipitation each year, and there's some hardy vegetation, cactuses, yucca, things, scrub brush, um, those bushes that roll across just before there's a gunfight at the OK Corral. Um, that's the type of vegetation you would see in any semi-arid climate. Now, if there were more water there, if there were more rain, there would be more plants and there would be more evaporation but there's just not enough water so it's a dry climate the next dry climate is arid meaning there is no precipitation and no vegetation um, the Atacama Desert of Chile is the most arid place on earth um, I believe they had a rain shower once about 40 years ago and then other than that it's been about 400 years since I've had rain um, it literally never rains in parts of the Atacama Desert. Our next main climate category is going to be the mild climate, meaning they have seasons, and it's usually fairly humid, although not, you know, well, our first example is the marine west coast. This is as humid as it gets. It's essentially a temperate rainforest, meaning they get as much precipitation as a tropical rainforest, but it's more mid-latitude and they have seasons. Um, I've been to Northern California 
Um, it's pretty amazing. You, you're driving along the beach and you go over a hill and you're in a rainforest. And what I mean by rainforest is giant redwood trees, sequoias, um, this Spanish moss hangs from the trees. And what I remember best is the banana slug that was this long, bright yellow slug crawling across the tree stump. Our next mild climate is going to be Mediterranean. Now, Mediterranean climate is a little drier than the last one. The best example, uh, besides the Mediterranean, the best example we have in the United States of a Mediterranean climate is pretty much, you know, you go about 50 miles south of San Francisco all the way down to San Diego, the entire west coast, Los Angeles, San Diego, and all those areas. That would be a Mediterranean climate. They get precipitation, yeah. It's warm almost year-round, yeah, but there's some seasonal variation to the temperature. Third one would be humid subtropical. This is a little drier yet, and the example we have in the United States would be the southeastern United States, Florida, or at least the northern por portion of Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, into Virginia. That would be humid subtropical. It's a little drier yet, and yeah, still with seasons. Now we go into the continental. Now we talked about how water has an effect on climate. Water moderates the climate, meaning the winters are a little warmer than they ought to be and the summers are a little cooler than they ought to be. A continental climate, meaning it's far from the ocean, is just the opposite. It's got very, very cold winters and very, very, very hot summers. So we'd say an extreme temperature and humidity, humidity variations throughout the year. We'll start with warm summer continental. This is about where we are on south to about Virginia. That would be a warm summer continental. We have very cold winters, we have very hot summers, and it's not super wet. We get, I think, and don't quote me on the number, but it's somewhere around 60 inches of rainfall a year, I think, which isn't very much. It might be 30 inches. Don't quote me on the number. Um, the next subcategory of continental climate would be cool summer. So pretty much you go up to about Glens Falls and then head north into Canada and that is the cool summer continental. It's colder yet in the winter, maybe not quite as warm in the summer. And still, you know, you have seasons and not as very wet and it's, you know, there's not a lot to it. Basically it's the climate we have but a little cooler. The next one is subarctic. So you're talking about very cold winters and cool summers. Alaska, um, northern, or actually, actually more like central Canada. Um, that would be the subarctic. If we continue on, we go into the polar category of climates, meaning it's cold and it's dry. Um, the North Pole and the South Pole are both very dry areas of the Earth. Um, now, the North Pole is in an ocean, so you don't really notice it, but there are parts of the Antarctic that are desert. Now, further south from the actual ice cap, we have what's called the tundra, meaning they get a month or two or so of above freezing temperatures, and that's enough for plants to grow. Now, there's still a permafrost underneath the soil, only the top foot or so melts and allows plants to grow. So you don't get plants with very deep root systems, so you end up with grasses and very small shrubs and that sort of thing. And you can kind of tell in this picture, you can see the snow line, you're really not far from the ice cap anywhere in the tundra. The last main category of polar, the last subcategory of the main category of polar would be the ice cap. And that's where they have year-round snow and ice. Now, what if we went to Mount Kilimanjaro? What kind of climate would we see? Um, we'd start at the bottom, you know, there's savanna, kind of forest, rainforest, it's almost kind of um, rainforesty savanna, depending on how far away from the mountain you get. Um, but at the top of the mountain, you're in ice cap. So this poses a problem for climatologists. So they made up a separate category just for mountains and plateaus. Um, it's basically called a high elevation climate, and you have highland, oops, sorry, I'm back. You have the highland climate, which are the mountains, and the upland climate, which is the plateau. So, for example, the Himalayan plateau, um, if you go north of the Himalayan mountains, um, it's still very, very high elevation and a plateau. Um, this is some place where basically the climate ch zones change so quickly that it's not really worth trying to map it out on a particular map. Um, this is Kilimanjaro, by the way. You can see we're in savanna here. 
I believe as you get up closer to the base of the mountain there's actually forest and then you start up and you're going to go through the different climate zones that we just listed until you get to the top where there's ice cap at least for a few more years right now the glaciers are melting and they'll probably be gone within 20 years or so okay let's look at New York you guys are going to be making your own maps of climate in class next time but I just kind of wanted to show you this this is not a climate map of New York this is a minimum temperature map of New York. So between the periods of 1976 and 2005, they took a measurement of the lowest temperature. So if you look where we are here in um, kind of central Albany County, we're right about here. Um, we're in the light blue. So the coolest temperatures we've had in Fahrenheit have been between minus 10 and minus 15. Um, if you go up into the Adirondacks, you can get up to minus 35 in this area and over here in the high peaks. Um, now, I always thought it was weird when I, I went to school in Brockport, which is just to the west of Rochester, and I lived in Buffalo for about two years. And I always found it so strange out there because from those areas, as you go south, it gets colder. When you go down on this map down here, it gets colder. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, elevation. This is the Allegheny Plateau it's higher up so it's colder and number two the Great Lakes the Great Lakes modify the temperature just like an ocean would they're big enough to do that so right along the lake shore you'll find that the, the minimum temperatures are very much moderated where we live makes a little more logical sense as you go south temperatures generally get warmer down toward Long Island and as you go north it gets colder up toward Canada here's a map of average precipitation what you'll find is there's these big bullseyes of a lot of precipitation around the Adirondacks and around the Catskills and that's an orographic effect meaning um, as the air gets forced up we talked about this in class already as the air gets forced up it cools expands actually it expands that cools and causes precipitation especially right off the end of Lake Ontario right here on a west to east wind they get a lot of precipitation here in the Tug Hill Plateau um, central New York is fairly dry Western New York, at least southwestern New York, you're getting a lot of precipitation off Lake Erie. I'm done. If you have any questions, please write them down on your paper. We'll talk about this in class, and you'll be doing an activity where you'll be making a map of the climate. Thank you.